And now I want to throw off the shackles of the here and now, supercharge your imagination and teleport you into the future. Your guides on this journey are Monique Conheedy, Chair of the Moreland Energy Foundation. So just put up your hand, Monique. And uh, Susie Burke from the Australian Psychological Society. Matthew Wright from Zero Emissions Australia. The co-founder of Permaculture, David Holmgren of Holmgren Design. And Grant Blaschke, GP and Associate Professor at the Nossel Institute for Global Health. Well, it's 2030 and the world is firmly on a path to low carbon economies and societies. Governments across the world introduced low carbon policies for energy and transport. Zero carbon homes and buildings are now commonplace. And many individuals and businesses now generate their own energy from the sun <coughs> and the wind. The health of people was a key factor in motivating this shift. So now each of my guests are going to outline what it looks like in 2030. And uh, then we're going to get you involved and I'm sure you'll have a number of challenging questions to put. So Monique Conheedy, in 2015 you were on the board of the Moreland Energy Foundation. After co-founding and being CEO of FlexiCar, you sold that business to Hertz Car Rental, where you, retained, you were retained as a marketing business partner. Now 15 years down the track, your training in engineering and the arts has paid off. You're still a director on a number of boards, but female directors match men 50-50 on Australian boards, as they do in the Parliament. You have a 15-year-old daughter now who keeps you focused on the future, and you've realised your dream and become a serial ecopreneur. What does transport look like in 2030, and how do we get around? And here's the point. Thank you. Um, so yes, the world has changed by 2030 and for the better, thankfully. Uh, from a transport perspective, I'm pleased to, pleased to report that we've used technology and innovation to see us change our whole transport system. We started leading it with te technology and innovation. However, what became really clear was we needed the public support and the health of people, as Alex said, was a key driver of that. Um, and we also needed investment. So we realised that, you know, health, is, um, transport is really linked to our health, is really linked to climate change. So it's no surprise, I don't think, that um, a country like Australia that is, has one of the highest obesity rates also has one of the highest private car ownership rates. We started to realise that our public trans, our, our road-based system was leading us to be overweight it was leading us to be dislocated in terms of our community, in terms of urban sprawl, and so we decided to do something about this. The things that we did was we started to design our cities to support the basic form of transport much better, walking. So we started to walk more. We started to have um, our jobs and our, our schools and our, our places of employment and recreation and entertainment all within walking distance. We, we invested in uh, cycling infrastructure, and most people just walked and cycled. That's, that's all we do now, and we stay healthy, and the obesity rates have gone down. We do still have a road-based uh, road -based system, but some of the interesting things that have happened is we've taken all private cars off the road. We've decided that that space is actually public space. That space isn't for private, private mobiles to be, to be parked there. And so we've taken away all of that parking space. We've made people who have private cars park off street, and, and as a private as a private um, uh, asset, they can deal with paying for the parking that privately. What we do have left on our streets are pods of cars, and they, we don't need the whole streets to be lined with cars anymore. We've realised that we only, we, one car can service the needs of 20 or 30 people. So at the end of a street. We have a bank of cars that have um, um, that have um, are powered by um, elect electric and battery and solar and wind, so they have zero emission vehicles. And all that extra space is space for us to do things in our um, in our community. Um, the other key things that we have done is invested heavily in public transport. 
So we realised that we need a strong public transport system to support the community. And the key thing about that investment, whether it's at lots of scales from local public transport through to mass rapid transit, but we've linked the whole thing through one card. So our My Key card not only gets us on the tram, train and bus, it gets us into those shared vehicles at the end of our street. It gets us, it swipes us into the shared bicycle um, um, that we also have on our street. And it's an integrated system that your public transport, um, you, all your public transport needs are met with one card. So that well, one of the things that has happened is that every time there has been a natural disaster and people have had their homes damaged, the homes have been built back better. So they've been built to 10 star ratings, they've not needed to have heating and cooling systems in them because of the you know, strong insulation and the, the well-designed buildings. So that's been something that people have really embraced and has been real positive. But the other thing that's happened is because everybody's very aware of the threat of natural disasters in their communities, um, and, and because of the decentralisation of government and you know, federal government, state governments not having nearly as much of a part to play in people's daily lives, local councils being much more, uh, having, having all the power and having a lot of the money to be able to you know, support things, um, the communities, the, the disaster preparedness has been at a community or at a neighbourhood or at a street level. So the designs of um, the, the community fire guards that used to happen in rural areas but only in you know, small parts are now widespread so in most regions the neighbours will be working together they'll be meeting regularly as you're coming up with disasters a bushfire or a, or a flood or a cyclone season uh, meeting together with their plans so everybody in the neighbourhood would then know each other very well and then when an event did happen you would know which was the safest house in your street to shelter in and that house would be the one that people would be able to collectively you know protect from the disaster and that then would become the if the other houses in the neighborhood were damaged or destroyed that would be then the hub where people would stay so there was a lot more community support and it also meant that after disasters there was a, a there was a greater resilience for people to be able to bounce back afterwards because the neighbors knew each other so it was a collective shared experience and communities stayed together instead of having to move somewhere else if their community had been damaged they were able to stay in the area and rebuild and, and like the transition town movement said they'd stay where you are dig in and make it better so uh, yeah 2013 2014 i did my master's thesis and uh, i built a case study which was a prototype of what uh, what houses will look like when they're effectively clad, that means covered in solar photovoltaic. <coughs> solar panels are pretty cheap now and they're getting cheaper. So I built a case study back then, way back then, 15 years ago, solar's a lot cheaper now. Um, uh, and, and I put 84 panels on the roof of a, of a Sunbury uh, sort of big mansion, you know, big house. And uh, I turned, uh, I also did an efficiency upgrade on this house and it was originally importing about 28 megawatt hours of energy into the site, but I turned it around to exporting uh, 10 times the amount of energy as what it was importing. So I started exporting uh, over 20 megawatt hours and importing two megawatt hours. Now, then there's a little bit more to it, but to do some simple numbers, if there were seven and a half million detached houses in Australia and you applied the same uh, cladding of the house with PV, so that means panels on the north, south, east and west uh, facing, then uh, you'd generate about 195 terawatt hours of electricity a year, which we could easily replace 175 terawatt hours of fossil fuels for electricity. But at the same time, you'd be eliminating gas from those domestic residences. You'd be doing the huge efficiency upgrades. So you'd be creating, uh, in terms of megawatts, you'd be creating another another 60 uh, terawatt hours of megawatts. And, and you, then you sort of run that idea through. Could you put that in terms of perhaps power stations or dollars well, per hour? Well, the 195 terawatt hours was, we, we produce 175 terawatt hours of fossil fuels. So that's, you know, say 20 or 30 power stations across the country, major power stations produce that. So you'd be closing down Loyang A, Loyang B, closing down Hazelwood, closing down uh, Yellow One, closing down uh, Bayswater, uh, closing down um, Collie, if it isn't already. Um, no, it's not. Uh, you know, you're closing out all those power plants. Um, it, the, the plan wasn't to discount other renewables, so there, there was opportunity with fuel switching from, from gas and other things, because we're basically eliminating gas from the energy supply at the same time. Um, so at the same time, back in 2015, we didn't just focus on putting PV, cladding houses in PV, but we did a big push there. At the same time, we expanded the renewable energy target for on-grid renewables, because at the time we knew 
the best idea was to follow the multiple plausible paths that are out there. And so wind power and solar power in the field were considered that. But what we did find with rooftop solar PV was you didn't need planning. You didn't need to do ground penetrations when you're out in the field. You didn't need to take labour to remote locations and organise that. Uh, you could have a, a panel come out of the factory, which could be located here in Australia, but ultimately they were located in China. Um, and 60 days later, it'd be generating energy on the rooftop of a house. Um, so it's ready for revenue generation within 60 days, which is amazing in, in power uh, engineering terms to be able to get power from something's manufacturing two months ago. Well, the global financial crisis, which was already leveraging the world up to levels of debt that have been unprecedented in history, was of course pushed on much further. And the instabilities that were, were showing very clearly in 2015 uh, led to the uh, what was called the Second Great Depression, but in, in fact it was much larger uh, than the one of the, the 20th century. And of course this has uh, had the uh, effect of uh, the largest and most rapid drop in greenhouse gas emissions as global trade shrank to 25% of what it had been uh, within two years, basically due to letters of credit and the whole global intellect system that stalls even though the resources are there and there may be some uh, demand. Uh, the, of course, there were all sorts of adverse effects that uh, people made a lot of comparisons to what uh, was happening in Greece uh, from 2010 to 2015 or the, the collapse of the Soviet Union in the, in the 90s and that had uh, fairly substantial uh, adverse health effects, alcoholism and uh, rising crime rates and all of those uh, sorts of things that could be expected from uh, uh, collapsed economies. Uh, but the really great surprise was this explosive growth in household and community non-monetary economies on a scale that had never been seen in any previous uh, economic downturn when of course always people start doing things for themselves outside the monetary economies. Uh, some of this was stimulated by uh, sharing networks and also over capacity that already existed on behalf of the big and also middle class people on the planet who had heaps of spare capacity in their houses for more people to live in uh, and also uh, uh, ride sharing and all of those sorts of things. So this massive behavioural change uh, allowed this huge flexibility which also further contracted the monetary economies. And there was this enormous debate as to whether this explosion in, in these non-monetary economies was actually a threat that needed to be uh, stamped out because it affected mm -hmm. uh, corporate profits and also uh, the tax base of governments or whether this was actually a pathway to resilience that should be assisted and facilitated. And that huge debate went back and forth and somehow uh, the, the debate was won by those in power who said it needs to be facilitated and supported. And so with that came really a command economy after the failure of market economies and governments rediscovered that they were the government and they actually still <laughs> mandated and did a lot of the things that Matthew's talking about but at a much smaller scale because there wasn't the supercharged capital debt finance that the previous world uh, was operating on policy change had a great effect that we didn't expect. So uh, Susie Burke was instrumental in allowing the psychologists to prescribe back in 2015. And they immediately came up with a new diagnostic manual which included climate delusion disorder. <laughs> and within a few weeks, they had an enormous number of our politicians on medication, strong medications. <laughs> They weren't fully sure of all the side effects, but they more or less worked. <laughs> Australia's policy just changed, like, instantly. It was amazing. <laughs> but as well as that, <laughs> um, we, there'd been a realisation by the sort of health economist boffins that the biggest problem for our health system at the moment is what they called the non-communicable diseases, that uncreative term that just means obesity and diabetes and 
um, mental health problems and cancers and things. And they realised, for example, in 2015, that of the 50 million or so people that die in a year, that 36 million of those were dying of obesity, diabetes, related problems, all those issues. So there was a real rethink about that it might be worth trying to prevent these problems. So it's a big preventive shift. A lot of the money went into primary care and they came up with a new uh, provider to work in primary care, the Sustainability Lifestyle Advisor. And the GP could fill out a sustainable care plan and the um, patients could meet with their advisor and look at all aspects of their lifestyle, their transport, their food, their, the whole way they were approaching things. And this had a dramatic um, shift in the community. So we're very pleased with that. Finally, although we got on to climate change after a very successful Paris meeting, which set the ball rolling, there was still enough inertia in the system where we really had to work on our hospitals and make sure that they could adapt to climate change problems and more heat waves and droughts and floods and things. And the whole educational program changed for the med students and the registrars so that they were very much focused on these social determinants of health.